Okay. Uh, I will, Mark, I will introduce you first. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Welcome to the part five of the International Christian University Linguistic Colloquium, as known as ICU Link. I'm Sumunli from International Christian University. Uh, this event is co organized with uh, Professor Tomoyuki Yoshida and Yoko Mizuta. Uh, today, we have two exciting talks by Mark Brunel from University of Ottawa and Mark Gerolik from uh, University of California, San Diego. Let me introduce Mark, uh, oh, Vosa Mark, the first speaker, Mark Brunel, uh, who is an associate professor of linguistic at the University of Ottawa. He received his PhD from Cornell University in 2005. Uh, he's been uh, working extensively on the phonetics and phonology of uh, Vietnamese and also Cham and also other Southeast Asian languages. Uh, <clears throat> and his work uh, on tone, intonation, and segmental effect uh, have been, I believe, uh, innovative and open new ways to think about how these phonetic dimensions uh, relate to each other. I think we first met at one of the SEALS conference somewhere in, maybe in Vietnam. SEALS uh, uh, stands for the Southeast Asian Linguistic Society. Uh, and ever since we our paths crossed multiple times at different conferences. And uh, it's good to uh, have you at the ICU link today. Uh, Mark and his colleague, Jean Brown, will talk about voicing and register in Raglai dialects, the underpinnings of transphonalization. Okay. Allow me to share my screen. So I'd like to mention that Jan Brown, my co-author, is uh, is attending. And uh, if you can turn your camera on, Jan, so that people can see you for a few seconds. <laughs> okay. So I will start immediately. Thank you for inviting us. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so. Today, as uh, Sun Hun just mentioned it, we're going to talk about voicing and register in two Raglai dialects that differ in the type of laryngeal contrast uh, that they have in plain stop. So one dialect has a voicing contrast, the other has a register contrast, and we're going to show how this uh, difference between two closely related varieties can help us to understand the underpinning of transphonologization. So before I start, I need to thank a few collaborators. So first and foremost, Fan Tuha, who is uh, on this picture here, who is at the University of Education in Ho Chi Minh City and who helped me with data collection in 2019. A few students at the University of Ottawa who've helped with data processing and uh, local authorities in Vietnam who have allowed us to conduct work in the province of Ninh Tuan. But, uh, most importantly, I would like to talk our Northern and Southern Raglai consultants without whom uh, this project wouldn't have been possible. Um, so I'll start uh, with uh, some background. So there are two language families in mainland Southeast Asia, Proto-Austroasiatic, also known as proto mon khmer I'll skip the details, and proto chamic uh, which is a branch of Austronesian that is spoken in mainland Southeast Asia that uh, are um, have been reconstructed as having a voice in contrast in onset styles. So on this map, Austroasiatic is in red and Chamic is in orange there in South Central Vietnam. So uh, we also know that these languages used to have a voice in contrast in stops because the uh, several of uh, their members, several languages in these families have uh, were written using index scripts in which they use the voicing, uh, the mark voicing in their consonant inventory. And uh, there are also conservative languages in both of these language families that preserve a voice and contrast in onset stops. However, in most of their daughter languages, the onset voice and contrast was replaced with a register contrast. So what is register? Register is a contrastive bundle of acoustic properties that develops from the loss of voicing and onset obstruents. So, just to give you an example, you start with a contrast between the syllable ba and the syllable pa. And at some point, the voicing in b gets lost. And what develops instead is a low register on a, voice on a voiceless stop. So the low register in this talk will be marked with a subset circle under the, the, the onset. And it's realized uh, with a combination of acoustic properties like pitch. So the low register typically has a lower pitch than the high register. Breathy, a breathy voice or a lax voice 
whereas the high register syllables have a modal voice, falling on glides, while high register vowels typically have rising on glides or no diphthongization, and most of the time a longer VOT and longer vowels. So not all languages use all of these properties, but typically they're going to use at least the two or three. Um, I'd like to mention very briefly that there are phonological contrasts that are very similar to register beyond Southeast Asia or outside Austroasiatic and Austronesian. There are related phenomena all the way to Africa, but uh, to most of the audience, uh, what may be familiar is the role of voicing in the development of tone systems. This is definitely something that is diachronically related to register, but we won't insist on the details. And I'd like to cite work by uh, two people and uh, two, two people in the two faculty in the audience today who have worked on a language language that has a, a contrast that is very similar to register and uh, Drenjonke, a language of Assam. So what does register sound like and look like? So I have a minimal pair here. I have a high register word Bye. and the low register word. Bye. Okay, so you can hear the breathiness difference and the voice quality difference. So this minimal pair was recorded from Trao and Nostro-Asiatic language that is spoken close to Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. So if you look at these uh, spectrograms, you can see that there are several differences between the two syllables. The first one is that you get a higher F0 in the high register. The second one is that you can see some ungliding at the beginning of the high register that is not present at the beginning of the low register vowel. And you can also see that there's a much longer VOT at the beginning of the low register syllable than at the big uh, vowel than at the beginning of the low, the high register vowel. Another difference you can see on the spectrogram, but that is less obvious, is the difference in voice quality or phonation. So if you're, you pay attention to the second foramen here, you can see that in the high register, it has a relatively high amplitude, while in the low register, the amplitude is dramatically decreased. So this kind of loss of amplitude in upper frequencies is a sign of breathiness. And it can be better seen in a narrow band spectrogram like this one in which you can see individual harmonics. So when you want to measure phonation, one way of measuring it, which is the one on which I'm gonna to focus today, is to measure the amplitude of the first harmonic minus the amplitude of a harmonic that is higher up in the frequency range. And in this talk, I'm gonna focus on H2, the second harmonic. So if you have a low difference between H1 and H2, H2, this uh, is a good indication that you have a modal phonation, a normal uh, voice. Whereas if you have a large difference between H1 minus H2, uh, you have an indication that you have breathiness or possibly lax voice. I'm gonna report other acoustic properties of phonation in uh, this presentation, but you'll see that they're strongly correlated with uh, H1 minus H2. So I, I'll probably skip the details. Unless you're a phonation fanatic, uh, the details don't necessarily matter that much. Okay, so we see that there's a relationship between voicing in, and register in Southeast Asian languages, but how does voicing develop into register? And the first question we need to ask is why is voicing so frequently neutralized in onset obstruents? And this seems to be due to uh, the aerodynamic voicing con constraints that was first uh, postulated by John O'Hala in the early 80s. So the general idea is that when you produce an obstruent, you have a full closure in the mouth. So if you want to produce voicing, you're going to have a flow of air from the subglottal cavity, from the lungs basically, into the supraglottal cavity. And this uh, transglottal airflow is going to make the vocal folds vibrate. But as air flows into the oral cavity, at some point air pressure is so high that it reaches an equal pressure as the subglottal pressure and the transglottal airflow will stop. So voicing is just gonna be interrupted. So if you have a relatively long closure, it should be difficult to produce voicing throughout. Now, there are ways to circumvent the uh, AVC. So like nasal leakage and stop lenition, but perhaps the most common, especially in the Southeast Asian context would be an expansion of the supraglottal cavity by either lowering your larynx or by fronting the tongue root. Now, I'm not gonna get into these details here, what matters is that these secondary mechanisms have been assumed to have an effect on, um, on well, 
to cause secondary articulatory properties when you're pro producing a voice in contrast. So this is the second important question here. We've seen that there are there's a number of acoustic properties in the register contrast. Um, do they match the secondary acoustic properties that are found in a voice in contrast? Most of the work we know about the secondary acoustic properties of voicing come from Western European languages, but there's some work on other languages as well. And it seems that uh, the effect of voicing on F0 and on formants is roughly in line with what is found in register systems. So F0 is higher immediately after voiceless stops. So this has been very well documented since the 19th century. And F1 is typically higher immediately after voiceless stops. Uh, something that has been known since the development of the spectrogram based on the work by, uh, by uh, Chiba and Kajiyama in Japan during World War II. However, it seems that voice quality does not necessarily go in the opposite direction. When you have a voicing contrast in a language in which, uh, well, no, when you have aspirated voiceless stops in a language with a voicing contrast, typically, you get breathier vowel after the voiceless stops rather than after the voice stops, which goes in the opposite direction from what is uh, attested in register systems. And then in languages in which voiceless stops are not clearly aspirated, there doesn't seem to be much of a phonation difference in the following vowel. So this is problematic. Another possible problem is that when onset voicing is neutralized outside, outside Southeast Asia, it seems that the outcome of voicing neutralization is not normally a form of register. And I'm citing three recent studies, one on Dutch, one on Afrikaans, and one are on Malagash, that seems to indicate that the loss of voicing would naturally be reinterpreted or be transphonologized into a two-way uh, F0 contrast or tone contrast. So basically, how the, on this slide, I'm trying to illustrate how you go from a voicing contrast on the onset to a fully transphonologized register contrast. And the basic assumption here is that voicing has secondary acoustic properties like F0, voice quality, and vowel quality, and that these get gradually reinterpreted into a register contrast. Now, various authors have proposed uh, scenarios to account for these developments. I'm, I've tried to present a unified account. I hope I'm not misrepresenting any previous claims. So at uh, the initial stage, you have a voicing contrast on onset stops. And then you have secondary acoustic properties of voicing that are realized at the beginning of the vowel. And these should be automatic effects. At the uh, second stage, it seems that these acoustic properties, these corticulatory properties of voicing get enhanced. So they get exaggerated. And when they get sufficiently exaggerated, you reach a redundant stage in which register is strong enough to be contrastive, but you still have voicing on a voicing contrast on the onset. So most speakers of the language would be ambivalent. It's very difficult to decide if the contrast is on the consonant or on the vowel. Once you've reached the stage, it is possible, not all languages do this, but it's, it's possible to lose the voicing contrast on the onset and to preserve a near register contrast. So now that we've established how register can develop from voicing, or at least what has been proposed in the past for registrogenesis, the development of register, let's see how things uh, work in a Chamic language. Chamic is a branch of Austronesian that is spoken in South Central Vietnam. So on this map, you can see a where Cham uh, Rag Lai is spoken in Vietnam. And then on this uh, zoomed up map, you can see that uh, the region where we've conducted our field work. So we worked in two dialects, Northern Rag Lai, which is spoken between Ning Tuan and Hang Hua, and we've, where we've uh, collected data on the Fuk Dai variety there. And then the, the other variety we've looked at is Southern Raglai. And we focused on Southern Raglai as spoken in Manoy and Southern Mintuan province. Now, these two varieties of Raglai are closely related. They probably split relatively recently because they're still perfectly mutually intelligible. So when the Northern Raglai speaker meets a Southern Raglai speaker, they each speak their own native variety and have no problems in terms of mutual intelligibility. However, there are some important phonological differences between the two dialects. 
And the most important one is that Northern Reli preserves a voicing contrast in plain stops, or has been described to preserve it. So you have voiceless stops and voice stops. Whereas in Southern Reli, the voice, the voice stops have been devoiced and uh, now, and the syllables that are headed by these, uh, these uh, stops now have a low register. So Southern Reglai has a register contrast, Northern Reglai still has a voice in contrast. Another small difference is that Northern Reglai preserves a series of voiced aspirates. However, there's just a handful of words that contain these consonants, or maybe two handfuls. Uh, and in Southern Reglai, they have merged with voiceless aspirated stops. So I'm not gonna talk about them very much. Okay, so what are research questions today? So the first question is how our previous descriptions of Northern Reglai voicing and Southern Reglai register in plain stops accurate? So are the previous descriptions on which we've based our initial uh, you know, uh, research project uh, accurate? The second question is, is the, if the voicing contrast is preserved in Northern Reglai, what are its secondary acoustic properties and do they match those of Southern Reglai register? And the third research question is, can matching properties, if there are any, be interpreted as phonetic precursors of register? So to answer these three questions, we have recorded data from uh, 22 speakers in each Reglai dialect, and we have a good balance for age and sex. We have recorded about 60 target words in each of the dialect, and we've decided to keep the experiment manageable for uh, participants. We've decided to focus on dental and velar onsets, so you have the full list there. And uh, we used these onsets followed by the vowels E, E, A, A, and U. So we tried to focus on open syllables or uh, syllables with sonorant codas to avoid perturbations from coda consonants, but it wasn't always possible. And I want to emphasize the fact that in this talk, we focus on results for words starting with plain stops. We recorded four repetitions of each word in a fixed frame sentence to keep the intonation constant. And we have two types of recordings here. We have a audio an audio recording, you can see the microphone here, but we also recorded an EGG signal. So EGG consists in putting two electrodes on each side of the speaker's larynx. And to try to measure the, to well, we just derive a low level electrical current between the two electrodes and measure the strength of the signal. If uh, you get a high electrical voltage, it's not that high, it's less than one volt. Um, it's a good indication that the two vocal, the vocal folds are touching, that the glottis is closed. And if you get a lower electrical signal, it's an indication that the glottis is open and that there is so basically leading to less conductivity. Um, so in practice, in this presentation, we mostly use the GG to try to uh, uh, mark the beginning and then the voicing in our audio recordings. But we're also going to report uh, one measure of phonation based on the CGG signal, the open quotient. So let's jump to the results immediately. So first, what's happening in um, onsets? So on this talk, you can see VOT in Reglai dialects. I've given you more data than what we're gonna focus on. We're gonna focus on plain stops, but you can see that aspirated stops generally have a positive VOT in both varieties, which is normal as they have the, the onset of voicing in these stops follows the release of the closure. And then implosives have a strong negative VOT, which is an indication that they have closure voicing. In plain stops, you have a more interesting scenario. In Northern Reglai, you have a negative VOT for voice stops, whereas you have a positive VOT for voiceless stops. So this is what we would be expecting. But notice here that in the green distribution, at the bottom of the green distribution, you have a few tokens of voice stops that seem to have a positive VOT that may be partly devoiced. In Southern Reglai, by contrast, it seems that both low register stops and high register stops have a positive VOT, even though some voice stops maintain some uh, remnants of voicing, but this is something that is relatively rare. Okay. So it seems that Northern Reglai does maintain a voicing contrast, whereas Southern Reglai has lost it, which is what previous descriptions were claiming. However, we quickly realized by looking at our data that um, there are more interesting things going on with voice stops. And I'm gonna show this to you 
with examples from the Northern Reli word mada, which means rich, which is produced in three different ways. And here on this slide, you have three different renditions of the same word by the same speaker. So the first type of voice stops we find is stops with full voicing. Mada. So you can see a continuous voice bar during the closure. So there's no interruption in voicing whatsoever. The second type is devoiced voice stops. Mada. Madag. So you can see that there is very little voicing in the, the closure here. There is some voicing at the very beginning of the closure, but that's called bleeding. That's perseverative voicing coming from the preceding sonorant. Uh, when uh, bleeding covered less than one third of the closure, we considered our consonant to be devoiced. And finally, our most interesting type of voice stop is voice stops with voiceless releases. So you can see here that you have a word, I'll play it, Madag. Madag. Okay, that has voicing throughout most of the closure, but towards the end of the closure, voicing stops, probably because of the aerodynamic voicing constraint, and voicing only resumes after the release of the, the closure, after the burst, uh, which means that Technically, this stop here would have a positive VOT, okay? So in the next slide, I'm gonna show you that if we break down the voice stops and the low register stops of Northern Reglai and Southern Reglai uh, into categories, we have a more diverse picture than what we found for uh, VOT. So on these two charts, you have Northern Reglai voice stops here on the left, Southern Reglai uh, low register stops on the right, and you have all the subjects here on the x-axis. Female speakers are on the left, male speakers are on the right, and what you can see very clearly in Northern Reglai is that while male speakers produce voicing the overwhelming majority of the time, so they always preserve full voicing during their voice stops, female speakers show serious signs of devoicing. So there are many female speakers who have voiceless releases, and there's even one female speaker who has occasional full devoicing. By contrast, in the Southern Reglai low register stops, female speakers usually realize their stops with uh, as fully devoiced, except perhaps for our oldest woman in the sample, and we don't know why. Whereas male speakers tend to preserve some form of voicing in their low register stops. You can see that there's a significant proportion of low register stops with voiced, voiced uh, closures, but that some speakers as well have maintained voiceless releases. So overall, it seems that men have an easier time producing voicing than women women tend to devoice more. Okay. So we see here that it seems to be accurate to say, to claim that Northern Reglai preserves the voicing contrast and onset stops while Southern Reglai doesn't have this contrast anymore. But now do we find sign of register in Southern Reglai or do we find something that looks like register in Northern Reglai? So to do this, we're gonna look at the acoustic properties of uh, vowels following the plain stop contrast. In uh, the following slides, uh, we lump uh, speakers together. We do averages of all speakers. So before doing this, we had to normalize all the acoustic properties. So we conducted a speaker uh, normal uh, Z normalization by speaker. And then uh, to facilitate the interpretation of the slides, we reported back all our, um, our measures onto intuitive scales. And you have the formula here if you're interested. So let's look at F0 first. So on this chart, you have uh, mean values for the low register, the high register, and for sonorants in blue. Uh, the sonorants are included as a baseline. Since the sonorants do not have a voicing contrast, they're probably the neutral case scenario. And then the small lines you see at the back are individual productions, and they're included to give you an idea of what's the range of variation that is found in the data set. So if you look at F0 in Northern Reglai, you can see that there is actually a higher F0 after voice stops than after voiceless stops in green. Okay, so that's the opposite of what we would be expecting, but this difference is not significant. In Southern Reglai, you also find this pattern a higher F0 after in low register stops in red than in high register that after high register stops in green. But once again, the difference is not significant. 
Turning to phonation, I'm going to discuss H1 minus H2, the spectral slope measure I mentioned at the beginning. But if you're interested in phonation, you can look at open quotient measures here and at uh, kepstrel peak prominence measures on the right. So this is a measure of the amount of noise in the spectrum. And you can see that these results go in the same direction as the spectral, as H1 minus H2. So basically, what we're finding is that in Northern Reglai, <clears throat> vowel following voice stops are breathier than vowels following voiceless stops, or maybe they're laxer, we're not committing. Whereas, it, but the, the difference here is not significant. Whereas in Southern Reglai, you have a much greater difference. You have definitely uh, breathier or laxer vowels after a low register stops than after, after high register stops. And here the difference is significant. So there is a clear phonation difference between the two registers in Reglai. Turning to vowel quality, we see, uh, look, turning to F1 first, we see that for uh, in Northern Reglai, you have a statistically significant difference in F1 after voice stops in red and voiceless stops in green in, after the, in the vowel A ah, and in the mid vowels N A. Ah. However, this difference is not significant in high vowels E and U. In Southern Reglai, the difference is even greater you have a significant difference between uh, the low register the low register and the high register for all the vowels including the high vowels and actually the difference is so large that it could be interpreted as the presence of a falling on glide at the beginning of low register vowels regardless of the vowel F2 is a little more complicated. So here you can see that in Northern Reglai, many vowels do not show statistical, uh, statistical, uh, statistically significant differences, sorry. Uh, for the mid vowels, you can see that the vowels following voice stops in red seem to pattern differently from the other, uh, from the voiceless stops and from the sonorants. But these weird patterns seem to be due to the presence of some codas that have an effect on F2. In Southern Reglai, on the other hand, there is a strong, but statistic, no, there is a weak, but statistically significant effect in all vowels except ah. So you can see that you have a higher F2 in the low register than in the high register, but this difference is relatively minor. So in a nutshell, it seems that there are many possible acoustic properties that could be used to distinguish registers in Southern Reglai but that there's not that much of an effect on voicing on the various vocalic properties in Northern Reglai. However, since we have various possible acoustic properties of register in Southern Reglai, it seemed important to decide which ones are primary and which ones are less important. And in order to do so, we tried to weigh the various acoustic cues used in our, well, uh, you, uh, that we've, uh, we've uh, looked at so far. There are various techniques to calculate Q weights, and uh, we've decided to uh, use Cohen's D's. So Cohen's D's are a way to calculate the separation between two distributions or two samples. So what we're doing is that we're subtracting the mean uh, of the low register from the mean obtained from the high register tokens, and we're divided everything by the standard deviation. In a nutshell, what does it uh, yield? If you have two distributions that have very different means and that have relatively uh, little variability, they have small standard deviations, you're gonna get a large Cohen's D and you're gonna get uh, an acoustic property that distinguishes the two categories relatively well. Here it would be the two registers. If you have two uh, distributions that have very similar, similar means, they're gonna have a relatively small Cohen's D, even if they have little variation, if they have uh, small standard deviations, because there's a lot of overlap between the two categories. And then finally, if you have two distributions that have very separate means, but that have large standard deviations, a lot of variability, you're also gonna have a lot of overlap between the two categories. So you're gonna get a low weight, a smaller Cohen's D. So what does it look like for the data we've obtained so far? So these intimidating charts, but I'll walk you through. So first on the X axis, you have the participants, you have the female speakers on the left and the male speakers on the right. And on the Y axis, you have the Cohen's D's are the acoustic weight of each property. If a property is close to zero, it means that it has a very low weight. It has a very low Cohen's D. But if a property has a high or 
a strong positive or a strong negative Cohen D. Uh, it means that it has a strong acoustic weight. It means that it's a very contrastive property. It's an acoustic property that could be used to distinguish the contrast. So if we look at Northern Regli, we can immediately see that the property that has the highest weight is VOT. So the little X's with circles around them in pink. Okay, so you can see that it's uh, this property has a much higher Cohen's D than all the other acoustic properties. And you can also notice that it tends to have a higher weight in men than in women. There is some variation in the other properties here and there. If you look at the other symbols, you can see that they're not uh, necessarily all ranked at the same way for all speakers, but they tend to congregate towards the zero baseline. By contrast, in Southern Regli, VOT doesn't seem to be very important. It's close to the zero line. But the green triangles that represent F1 have a relatively high weight. So it seems that F1 would be the primary property of the register contrast in Southern Regli. And if you look carefully, you can see that the red circles and that the blue squares also have relatively high Cohen's Ds for most speakers which since these two properties are uh, acoustic properties of phonation or of voice quality, that would be a sign that phonation or voice quality is a secondary property of the Southern Regli register contrast. So let's try to summarize these results. So first, my, our first question was, are previous descriptions of Northern Regli voicing and Southern Regli register and plane stops accurate? And it seems that Northern Regli does preserve a voicing contrast in plane stops, even if there's evidence for partial devoicing in women. And it also seems that Southern Regli has indeed replaced voicing with the two-way register contrast. So even if voicing is occasionally present in men. Uh, in Southern Regli, it seems that F1 is by far the dominant register property and that phonation plays a secondary role in the register contrast, a secondary role that is probably greater in high vowels where the F1 difference is more limited. The second question, our second question is, if the voice in contrast is preserved in Northern Regli, what are its secondary acoustic properties and do they match those of Southern Regli register? And it seems that there is a weak effect of voicing on F1 in low and mid-low vowels that seems to mirror Southern Regli register. But that in Northern Regli, phonation and F1 in high vowels only show marginal differences that even if they go in the right direction, do not typically reach statistical significance. So we get very small differences in, in Northern Regli. So could it be um, an issue of statistical power? Is it possible that we simply don't have enough data to detect a weak effect? Yes, this is definitely possible, but that would still mean that the effect of voicing on the following vowel is pretty weak. So now let's think about our third questions. Could, can we, is it possible to claim that there are precursors of register in the Northern Regli voicing system? So a first interesting observation here is that as I've noticed earlier, uh, female speakers tend to have, show more signs of devoicing in Northern Regli than male speakers. Uh, so perhaps uh, what these female speakers are doing is something that is very similar to the way in which voicing was lost in Southern Regli when uh, Southern Regli started developing its register contrast. And the fact that it's women who do this is interesting because we know that in most types of sociophonetic changes, it is women who lead. However, aside for from F1 in low and mid vowels, none of the acoustic indicators measured in our pooled Northern Regli data is sufficiently affected by voicing to be claimed as a precursor to register formation. So was this all a wild goose chase? Possibly not. Maybe we haven't been asking the question in the right way. Is it possible that there could be stronger precursors of register specifically in the speech of the speakers who exhibit more devoicing, especially in women? So in order to determine this, we did a correlation between the production weights of Northern Regli speakers. So we basically correlated the uh, Q weight of VOT with the Q weights of all the other acoustic properties we've uh, reported so far. And what we find is that there is a statistically significant correlation between VOT and the two phonation measures. So what this seems to indicate is that when speakers have a strong VOT contrast, 
they may not use phonation very much to distinguish as a secondary property of voicing, but that when speakers and especially female speakers have a low VOT contrast or show signs par of partial devoicing, they may be using phonation to a more significant extent. So since this is very difficult to visualize on this chart, we've produced another chart that looks at the two, acu at two acoustic properties of uh, phonation in voicers and devoicers. Okay, the voicers are speakers who have partial devoicing or who show signs of losing the voicing contrast or reducing its importance. And the voicers are speakers who produce true voicing in most of their to tokens. So they include all men and some women. So we're, what we're finding here is that for the two acoustic properties of phonation, H1 minus H2 and capsule peak prominence, the differences in voicers are not significant. Whereas in the voicers, you can see that you have a much larger difference between the vowels following the voice series and the voiceless series. And you can see that you have a statistically significant difference. Okay, so this would seem to support the claim that at an early stage, devoicing results in aspiration or in breathiness. And that's a claim that has been made in the literature on register formation for 60 years but that as far as we know, this is the first time there is positive evidence for it. So are there precursors of register in Northern Reglai? Our results support the idea that there are two types of precursors of register in the dialect, a significantly lower F1 after voice stops and low and mid vowels that is significant across speakers, but also a significantly breathier phonation after voice stops just in speakers who show early signs of devoicing. Now, it turns out that these two properties are also the most important acoustic cues of register in Southern Reglai, even if they've been uh, dramatically exaggerated or enhanced in the, that variety. So I'm basically done, but I believe our results lead to new questions. So the first question is, why is the aerodynamic voicing constraint affecting women more than men? And we find a similar pattern in other Southeast Asian languages for which we have data. It's not all published, but it appears that this difference is also found in uh, American English, Chicano Spanish, and in Dutch. Um, we suspect that there may be an explanation for this in the literature. We haven't found it yet, but if you have uh, papers to suggest, we would welcome them. Uh, you know, this is, this is probably something people have talked about in the past. Our second question is, what is the relation between voice stops with a voiceless release and breathy phonation? And we see two possible explanations. The first one is that the weak translocal airflow that causes the AVC also results in breathy phonation because of a disruption of the Bernoulli effect. And then the second mechanism that is not incompatible with the first one would be that the compensatory mechanism that are meant to overcome the AVC fail in some speakers, but still affect their spectral properties. And these mechanisms would probably be larynx lowering, a mechanism that could have, that is known to affect F0, vowel formants and possibly phonation, but also tongue root advancement that would, that is, that obviously affects vowel quality. Finally, why is there no effect of voicing on F0 in Northern Reglai, given what we know about the relation between voicing and laryngeal contrast in other languages? So could the Northern Reglai voicing contrast be intrinsically different from voicing in most languages? I don't think we want to claim this, but perhaps there's a, there are some differences in terms of fine laryngeal detail. So for example, in several European languages, it's been established that uh, there is an increased longitudinal tension of the vocal folds to suppress voicing and voiceless stops. Uh, and that it is this mechanism that seems to indirectly raise F0. So if in, in Reglai dialects, for some reason, it wasn't necessary to produce additional mechanisms to suppress voicing and voiceless stops, perhaps there would be no reason for a higher F0 after these voiceless stops. Finally, the obvious question, the, I mean, the, 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 the skeleton in the closet or the elephant in the room is that uh, is 
that we have acoustic data on uh, the register contrast in Regli, but that even if some acoustic properties seem to be good indicator for indicators for the register contrast, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are relevant to native listeners when they're doing a perception task. So uh, we've been supposed to conduct an experiment experiment in the, uh, no, an identification experiment in Vietnam for two years now, but before, because of the COVID pandemic, we haven't been able to go back to Vietnam Vietnam in 2020, and we won't be able to go back this year. So hopefully we're going to be able to conduct the perception experiment next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. And we would like to invite you back once we have the <laughs> perception <laughs> data. <laughs> Great. Uh, even before that, <laughs> hopefully we can have you back. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, we have uh, the first question from Shigeto Kawahara at KU University. Mark, this is great stuff. I really enjoyed it. I have a couple of questions, but I limit myself to one. So I think you showed that in the Southern dialect, if one is the like the, the primary contrast or acoustic cue for that contrast. Right? Yes. The first sub question is like, you know, if one conveys vowel height contrast too, so yes. right. why would speakers do that? Right. I mean, if, they do it independently for different vowels, obviously. Right. right. But you also show, I think that when there's, uh, when for high vowels, you mm. don't see a big, too much bigger difference. Now that makes sense because you have to keep F1 low or it stays that way because your mouth is closed. So in that vocalic context, it's really F1 still the major acoustic correlate. Yes. Okay. So uh, basically, if you the the way to look at this is to break down the acoustic weights by vowel, right? Right. right to right. see if phonation yeah, is, yeah. and it seems that vo uh, phonation is marginally more important in the in the high vowels than it is elsewhere. This is something that has also been found in true and other Chamic language that is close to Southern Ruglai. It's actually spoken 50 kilometers away, so these people are in contact, uh, but it's fairly different. It's not. Well, it's mutually, mutually intelligible, but it's a little more different than Northern and Southern Rely. But I believe that has also been found by Jian Jing Kuang in Southern Yi. Uh, I'm not sure it's Southern Yi, but in the Yi variety. So she also finds that uh, uh, phonation plays more of a role in high vowels than in other vowels. Right. Now, why would this be the case? I have no explanation for the moment. We're, fi we've, we're finding this effect in more and more Southeast Asian languages. So the hope is that when we're going to have enough data, we're going to be able to do a cross-linguistic comparison yeah. and to isolate the reasons. But typically, I'm not challenging a result. You know, I think yeah. you've found something no, no, no. in Joker too, but I'm just curious why they would do that. But yeah. There's also work, I, I should add, that uh, there's a paper by Cristina Esposito and a co-author, I think it's Khan, mm -hmm. where they look at the effect of, F, of vowel height on phonation and find that, um, I believe, high vowels tend to be inherently breathier or to have an inherently higher spectral slope. So that, that may be part of the story. All right, great, thanks. Thank you, uh, Shigeto. And uh, next question comes from uh, Mark Erlek uh, from University of uh, UC San Diego. Hi, Mark. Thanks. This was very interesting. Um, I was wondering if, um, because I didn't get enough time to, to ingest all the figures, if you could um, return to slide 19. 19, me. yes. Give me a sec. I'll share the screen again. Yes, the one on formation. Right, uh, oops, 30, here you go. Okay, yeah, thanks. So I think what was interesting for me was that the for in Southern Regli, the H1, H2 data seem to suggest that the, it's the high register that's really differing um, compared to the, the sonorant baseline. Right. And I didn't get a chance to look at the CPP, but I'm doing so right now. So the CPP seems to go in the opposite direction, right? Where yes. the low register right. is noisier. Mm. So, yeah, so it's interesting. If I were just looking at H1 minus H2, I might say, are the high register stops more constricted in some way? But then looking at the CPP data, I'd say, are the low register stops more noisy? 
Right. And if you yes. look at the open quotient, it seems to be a little more like H1 minus H2. And it seems that other spectral slope measures like H1 minus A1 and H1 minus A3 are similar to H1 minus H2. And so I don't have an explanation for this, to be honest. I have a related fact. It seems that in some uh, many Chamic languages, there is register spreading from uh, so typically these languages have sesquisyllables. So in a nutshell, they have disyllabic word patterns. Mm -hmm. And then very often the first syllable has a stop, so it has a register, but then the main syllable, the second syllable starts in a sonorant. And then in these cases, very often register spreads through the sonorant. Mm -hmm. And then in some varieties, it seems that it's the low register that spreads through the sonorant. So that, now let, I'll explain this in a simpler way. If you take vowel uh, syllables that do not have a presyllable, uh, syllables that just start in the sonorant, it seems that in some varieties, sonorants pattern with the low register, whereas in other mm -hmm. varieties, sonorants pattern with the high register. And I'm wondering if this ambiguity in terms of which cues goes in which direction could explain the phonological spreading pattern that develops out of it. Right, okay. Yeah, I mean, so, another another possibility that comes to my mind is, Maybe that the the sonorants themselves are slightly lax in their voicing, not enough to cause much noise, so that they differ in CPP from the low register uh, stops, but enough to keep H1, H2 similar between the low register stops and the sonorants. Okay. Would you have any examples of languages in which sonorants pattern that way? Um, well, so I have a paper with Jen Jin Kuang and Amanda okay. Richard that looked at in E, um, in Southern E and other E languages, the sonorants are slightly breathier than we, what we okay. might expect, but the, the tense lax contrast in those languages also extends to the sonorants. So, um, so there's this additional, so this additional factor of having also tense sonorants, but in general, they tend to be breathier, but in different ways than the um, breathiness of the lax vowels. Mm. Other examples, um, I know Chris Carignan has some work on breathiness and sonorants in um, Southern French, uh, Southern European French. Um, I don't know if there are no other works coming to mind. Yeah. yeah I'll definitely look at this. This is interesting. Hmm. Thank you. So thank you. And uh, next question comes from So Miyagawa, Kyoto University. Hello, thank you so much, uh, Mark, uh, for a very, very interesting um, presentation and it's very wonderful. Um, I have a question from the more rather sociolinguistic perspe perspective because mm -hmm. uh, I study uh, language contact in Egypt and uh, um, I was wondering if there were some any um, social social mixings like um, intermarriage among uh, southern and northern Raghurai speakers and or other language groups and uh, I was wondering if there are any influence of surrounding languages um, also I would like to ask a uh, sort of social status and um, influence uh, of authoritative or prestigious languages in uh, these two Raghurai varieties. Right. Uh, so first of all, there doesn't seem to be much standardization. The, at the provincial level, the, the Department of Education has been trying to push Northern Raghurai as the standard, but I don't think this has had much impact on the, act, the situation in the field. Uh, the languages are uh, not only mutually intelligible, but uh, the, 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 the two groups mix to a significant extent. They meet for uh, religious ceremonies, for festivals, and there is a certain degree of intermarriage. Now, I wouldn't be able to tell you how much intermarriage there is, but I've met mixed couples. And when I was working in one village, it was not uncommon to meet someone from the other community. So there is probably daily contact between communities. The Southern Raglai speakers are also in contact with Tru, which is another Chamic language. Uh, and it seems to be at the level of you know, weekly visits or, you know, they visit each other on weekends, they're friends, but they don't live together in the same villages. Um, 
And then there is a lot of contact with there's there's contact with Vietnamese. It seems that the Northern Raglai sp speak much better Vietnamese and are much more in contact with with Vietnamese than the Southern Raglai speakers we've worked on because it's a fairly isolated isolated community, and uh, they don't even have schools in most villages. Whereas the Northern Raglais all have schools and Vietnamese school teachers, post postmasters, and. Um, I don't think Vietnamese is likely to have much of an impact on the Raglai system, especially since most people are dominant in Raglai. So contrary to other language communities in Vietnam, it seems that the language is alive and well in these communities to the extent that sometimes the Vietnamese that live in these areas speak Raglai. Hmm. And, uh, and then there may be some contact with Cham that is spoken close to the coast. Um, but I wouldn't be able to assess the extent of uh, contact with champs. The only champs I've seen in Raglai uh, villages are uh, used clothes peddlers, like the people who come to sell used clothes. But I don't think this necessarily constitutes very significant lang language contact. Thank you. Um, I was wondering um, about the kind of personal history of their uh, oldest, eldest uh, female speaker because she had uh, kind of different characteristic from others. Um, do do you know something about uh, her history, or she 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 lived and she grew up in the the community? She lived and grew up in the community. I don't, she doesn't seem to have anything special about. Oh, compared to other female speakers in that specific community. F a few people from this community have left, have spent any time in other province, uh, other provinces or in other, uh, in other areas. Some people have spent some time in the provincial capital, Phan Rang. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they went there for studies, for example, or they worked there for a few years. But time spent in other communities seems to be limited, except for two young women in the Southern Raglai community who spent two years in Saudi Arabia where they worked as maids, surprisingly. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much. It's very, it's very interesting. Thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, I think uh, we will continue this discussion in the breakout room. Uh, let's thank Mark one more time uh, uh, for the great talk about uh, Raglai community and we already reserved him for uh, after post-corona perception tests, <laughs> results sharing. Uh, so <laughs> we look forward to that. Yeah, let's stop the recording.